Well, good afternoon to everyone uh, online and, and in person here at USIP. My name is Keith Mines. I'm the director for Latin America at the Institute, <clears throat> which is a, an institute that's very interesting. If you haven't been here before, we'll give you a tour of the building afterwards, but it's a, an institute that was created by Congress in 1984 with the idea of helping to seek resolution to violent conflict around the world and to help countries that are in conflict to leave those conflicts and stay peaceful. We have a very robust program in Latin America. We're active in eight countries, Colombia, Venezuela, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Haiti. Um, we work from the bottom uh, to the top. <clears throat> we do policy recommendations, analysis, uh, programs, and support to peace builders on the ground. Uh, today it's my pleasure to welcome four discussants from the hemisphere who will offer their insights on the role of diasporas in building a more peaceful hemisphere. So joining us today is uh, Sandra Duval, an educator who works with Connect Plus from Haiti, Amparo Marroquin, Dean of Social Science and Humanities at the University of Central America from El Salvador, Rosalia Miller, President of the Nicaragua Freedom Coalition, and Hernando Viveres, uh, Viveros Cabezas, the Commissioner on Latin American Community Development in the DC government, who will join us in just a second. Uh, our discussion will be moderated by Jose Luis Sanz, <clears throat> editor of El Faro in English, and we'll have a nice discussion, a very interesting discussion about the relationship between diasporas and their home countries, which is very complex, differs widely between countries and within the various communities in the U.S. where they reside, but has the key to much of what we are all striving for in achieving a more peaceful hemisphere that has uh, a better future uh, for development and humanitarian assistance. So look forward to this rich discussion <clears throat> and hopefully some of these conclusions will be things that we can all take with us uh, back to our communities and that we at USIP can help to promote in our analysis and uh, in the way that we work in the hemisphere. So I'd like to invite our uh, discussants to please join me on the stage. Jose first, you'll be at the end. Rosalia. Sandra, and then, uh, as I said, Hernando will join us in just a second. He's already here. Nope, here he is. <clears throat> you all mic'd up? Thank you. Is all mic'd up? Okay. Great, Jose Luis, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, USIP, for the invitation. Sorry for my accent. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm glad to be here trying to fa facilitate this, this conversation. Uh, and thank you, especially um, Hernando, uh, for joining, because you just arrived from New York. <laughs> Your train just arrived in DC. Um, we're going to start with a few ideas from Amparo, and then if you're okay, we, I, we will guide uh, a few questions uh, for the panel, and at the end, we, we will open to questions from the audience. But first of all, Amparo. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think I can just be here. Yeah. Okay, I want to, to thank you to the Institute of Peace for inviting me on, and for being here. It's really an honor to be with all of you. And I have to apologize because I, I speak a broken English, but I try to, to be my best, to do my best. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to read. Um, to talk uh, about mobility, in a continent that hosts a large, of, a large part of the population that moves around the world is really a challenge. Uh, talking about the role and influence migrant communities have had in their countries of origins is a huge challenge, especially since there are many types of diasporas and many ways to migrate. Let us think, for example, of my country, El Salvador, uh, the UN data tell us 
that one in four Salvadorans lives outside the country. And from every three Salvadorans who have a job, two have found the work outside the, uh, their country. Uh, this means that my country is a country with a large ma majority of the population that is mobilized. This is not a strange for other countries like Nicaragua, Haiti, or Colombia. Destinations from and, and forms change, but the structure is the same. In general, when talking about the importance of diasporas is their place of origin, they usually talk about the importance of migration in economic terms. A very old fact in El Salvador, for example, uh, no, this. Uh, this uh, slide told us uh, how we live in El Salvador uh, in 1978 and how we live in El Salvador in 2004. It's like 20 years ago, but I want to focus in, in two indicates in the, in the graph. Um, this is, this is uh, a graph that's, that shows us uh, the income that we earn in El Salvador, and the red part implies the income earned from agriculture, the red one. In 1978, the 80% of our income comes from agriculture. In 2004, just the 4% of our income come from agriculture. And the yellow part is remittances. So in 1978, uh, I can see it here, but it's like 9%, 8% comes from remittances, and in 2004, almost 70% come from remittances. So it's like we have two different countries there. Um, and this is a situation that continues almost this year. This is the, a comparative uh, graph between uh, remittances and uh, the, how do you say, the, the exportation? Yeah, the export, the exports. So uh, this is a study of Central Reserve Bank published uh, last February revealed that 49% of these families will fall into poverty if they do not have remittances. Uh, during the first four months of this year's remittances have exceeded exports by more than $300 million. But the influence of the diasporas is not only focused on the economy. The same forms of social and political organizations have been influenced by migrants who deeply know the needs of their countries of origins, uh, but who also have enriched by knowledge of, of other organizational process. Migrants have the ability to build institutional synergies, programs such as Dos por Uno and Tres por Uno in Mexico, have been a sign of the ability of migrants to present in their local territories of their origin countries. Migrant organizations cross borders to link territories locally, strengthen local leaderships, and promote development projects that often go where the states of origin do not have a presence. In the daily life of the towns, Many migrants have returned to become mayors, for example, community leaders, questioning counterweights, critical figures, or simply voices that convene and build the community. The entire social life has been changing by migration, migration from its most important base, the family. Our families have always been diverse, but now they are also transnational. The grandmother who, from Cuyultitan in El Salvador, speak with the mother who is in Milan, in, Italia, in Italy, for example, and tells her about the child. Uh, she has already finished her 
uh, her homeworks, for example. Or the dad who sings happy birthday by a video call from Montreal winter to his teenage son. The campaign, uh, the global campaign that IOM uh, start seeks to praise how all people contribute to making the com their communities a better places to live and to call home, regardless of where they come from. That is what our countries have, the communities that we need to continue working. But this is not the only thing that migrants have given to their communities, <coughs> to their communities of origin. New tolerance exercise uh, arrived turned into music or prayers that were unknown to us. Migration has transformed the forms of celebrating in many communities of origin. If we go down from Mexico to the south, we will find ancestral traditions that incorporate other languages, dances, costumes, and gestures of the new transnational communities from which we live. Migration has enriched religious practices, food and cooking, ways of dressing in different moments, forms of communication, which have become more and more digital in communities where there is a lot of migration. What, it, what is communicate, since it is not just about learning about local life, but about the life of the other territories we inhabit, such as the community radio station that broadcasts a soccer game in Washington and in Intipuca in El Salvador, and the forms how we communicate. We think, speak, and live in English, and Spanish, and Spanglish, and Quechí, and Misquito, or Quechua. Migrants and community members are working together to make the places where they live and work more productive, innovative, caring, safe, and welcoming. They are committed to making their countries places that believe in the importance of inclusion, tolerance, acceptance, and collaboration. This is my first thought. So now let's have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Amparo. Uh, you said well, the topic of the diaspora is often addressed uh, from the perspective of migration, of the defense of the rights, but it's little uh, addressed um, or, or they are little recognized as, as political subjects, as cultural transformators, uh, of course, but uh, especially as political subjects in their countries of, of origin. And especially we want to talk about uh, today about the, f the diaspora's factor in the building of democracy, both in the US and especially in the countries of origin. Um, I have dozens of questions about this topic because I think we are especially in Central America and many of our countries uh, in a moment of transformation where the, the, when, when, when the, the diasporas are, are, uh, are, are Occupying a new spaces and a new leadership is being recognized. But I will just make a few of them, and then, as I said, we can include the audience. I want to start with you, Rosalia, um, mostly because because the Nicaraguan diaspora is, is probably one of, of the most uh, dynamic in, at this moment. Uh, Tragically, because uh, in, 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 the last, uh, in the last years, hundreds of thousands of Nicaraguans have fled their pressure in, 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 in Nicaragua. Uh, just last February, 222 uh, political prisoners arrived in Washington directly from jail into exile. And, and I think that's a dramatic expression of something that happens with most of the diaspora. And it's, we are talking about contributing to democracy and to change in, in Nicaragua, but at the same time, many of them are barely had time to settle. They, they, so in some, uh, at some point, I want to ask you and, and talk about how, how can a diaspora, you have been for, for decades here in the US, but most of them have not. How, how, how can the diaspora find the time, the energy for political activism 
when when they many of them have to find a job, a job, uh, a home, or or or, or process uh, follow the, the, the asylum asylum process. I, I mean, we are asking usually those who have been expelled to lead the fight for democracy in the country of origin. That's, that's a paradox. So what do you think about that? And what is your, your experience with the yes. uh, Nicaraguan diaspora? Thank you. Thank you so much. And. Um, for the questions, which I will answer momentarily. And you mentioned that the Nicaraguan diaspora is dynamic. Yes, we are dynamic, before I go on. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I do want to thank the Institute for Peace, uh, United States Institute for Peace uh, representatives here, and of course, uh, Keith Mines, the director for the Latin American program, and my colleagues, uh, panelists who are with me and the audience here, and a todos los nicaragüenses que están por todo el mundo. Uh, buenas tardes. Um, you know, I wanted to just put a point of reference um, that diaspora um, is uh, sometimes um, not confused, but it's not, um, they're used interchange interchangeably. Uh, and um, I, I think that rather than going to an academic description and, and turn this into an academic session, which is not, um, uh, I just want to say that we are really all together, the exiles and the diaspora right now. And that brings me then to your questions and your comments about the, um, the um, 222 Nicaraguans who came uh, on February 9th. Um, the um, Nicaraguans boarded that plane, not knowing where they were going to, to, to be going. They were in jail. They had been jailed and tortured um, psychologically, uh, something called white uh, Torture as well. Uh, in any case, they were um, they were asked to get dressed because they were going somewhere. Some of them that I spoke with uh, and my other colleagues in the diaspora um, were told that they thought they were going to be going to the firing squad. So that's how serious uh, and terrible this was. I also, though, before I continue, I want to be sure that I am very clear to to express to all of you that I I am not the representative of the diaspora, the Nicaraguan diaspora. I'm just one of the voices. Uh, and in fact, there is not one person that represents the diaspora. It's a whole lot of us. And we are dynamic. And we are working very, very hard. Um, so you mentioned a few things, quite a few things, in fact. Uh, and I wanted to get that um, really clear out of the way. Um, we are um, doing what we call, it all begins at a lower level of incidence meaning resistance. And so we have the everyday person, all kinds of people who decide to do a march in the streets uh, with cartelones and you know, saying, we want, the, here are the things that we want. There are very specific points that the diaspora would like to, um, it's not just to have, but to work for. Um, one of them is the release of all political prisoners. Um, there are 50 plus prisoners in the jails of Nicaragua right now. And there's one very, very special person there, and that's Monsignor Alvarez, Rolando Alvarez. He's being tortured um, uh, in all kinds of ways, and that is just not acceptable. In that same vein, there is the persecution of the, of the Catholic Church as well, and other, other religious entities, also unacceptable. And um, I believe it was last Friday, the... Um, the Ortega Murillo regime um, canceled, froze the, the uh, bank accounts of the religious uh, entities, the Catholic Church and others. Um, and I think that we all understand what that means. Um, very soon, there's not going to be resources to even buy the food for the, uh, for the priests. So that's, that's one part of that. Uh, that's one point. Another point that the Nicaraguan diaspora is just very much um, actively engaged is in, um, in just trying to see how the act of renacer uh, can actually be put into, um, it, it just needs more, it needs, I say that it just needs like, a, like a, an injection, you know, a shot in the arm to, to just lift it, uh, to be more, um, to, to address the, the actual issues of sanctions and, 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 uh, and, and, and all of that uh, that is in the, in, I won't go through the Renaissance Act here today, but it, it's somewhat dormant. And we want Congress, the United States Congress, 
we very much, and I hope they're all listening, and if they're not, I'll, we'll all make sure, um, our colleagues, that they do listen, um, that Renacer needs to be acted upon. So that's another point. Um, we are also concerned about the, um, the, the, the way that the financial institutions have been uh, supporting Ortega. Um, for example, uh, during the COVID uh, um, pandemic, um, resources were sent to Nicaragua for those vaccines, for those people, for the Pueblo, and they were not. The resources, the money was used for some other uh, things, um, certainly not for the populace. Um, I want to be clear, though, about the sanctions, just quickly, uh, that what we're hoping for is that sanctions are done targeted sanctions. We don't, want, we don't want the people of Nicaragua, the everyday person who already is struggling to eat, to survive. We don't want them to be harmed. So we're, being, we're talking about targeted sanctions, um, for instance, to the inner circle of Ortega where it's really going to hurt the most. Uh, and there are other, other things that the diaspora is working on. Uh, but I do, um, maybe I'll have an opportunity later. But I, before I, I, I finish, I hope that I have addressed the, the uh, points that you mentioned. A um, couple of things. Um, the 222 uh, ex-political prisoners, and it's a pleasure to say ex because they're no longer, they're here with us and other parts of the world. Um, I wanna uh, mention to you that the, um, the US government really came through uh, at the beginning to welcome them. USAID leased the plane. Um, they came through, it was a beautiful sight to go into that hotel where they came, where there was a, a, a corner here to give telephones and, and a travel agency to help with the trips, et cetera. They were wonderful. Uh, everyone was well-intentioned. But now the reality is that three and a half months have passed by and these people are in desperate need to be placed um, in more permanent um, spaces. And here we go again with the resources. And I am directing this to, to Congress as well because the, the laws come from Congress. Um, the, the, the representatives of the people of this country and, and uh, it could all change if, if the, the uh, parole situation is switched uh, so that they can, the TPS, excuse me, um, TPS is so important for Nicaraguans, just as it was done for the Afghanis, so that they can have a better protection um, for um, you know, medical and all of that medical services, jobs, and, and just a whole lot of things that TPS um, so TPS is temporary protection. You know, I suddenly went blank. Um, in any case, TPS is what we're desperately fighting for, and we hope that we will get that for Nicaraguans. And if they're listening, um, they hope that they do that. Uh, just lastly, um, it's good to say that while uh, we are a young, very young diaspora, we really became actively engaged since uh, April 18th uh, when the... Um, when there was the massacre of the students. And um, this, this month, April, that we just passed, and yesterday was Mother's Day in Nicaragua, and we honor the mothers who lost those children. And I am wearing black and white to honor them. Because white, uh, black is luto, or when I was growing up, is for adults, and white is for the innocent, and they were innocent. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that, because I think I've spoken far enough. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I exceeded myself. Exceeded. We will go back later to, to, to how, how diaspora struggle with both uh, the, their challenge here and the challenge in the countries of origin. In that sense, Sandra, I want to continue with you. Um, you, you were just telling me that you arrived in the US when you were 11. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in talking with you about what, another of the challenges that diaspora has often uh, face, and is the, 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 the question of identity and the relationship, the sometimes complex relationship, relationship with the country of, of origin that impacts especially in the second generation in, in, in immigrants, uh, and how usually or often the, the level of, of involvement in politics, in social debates, in the country of origin, kind of diminish um, with 
new generation, with the gener generational changes. Uh, which is your experience with that, uh, your personal experience, and, and how, how do you think that generational change has affected the Haiti and uh, diaspora? And because maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think it's less visible now than it was a few years ago. And do you think that's one of the factors? Um, so to answer your first question, um, I will say that I am a child of immigrants. Um, so I greet you as a Haitian woman, um, Haitian American woman. Uh, my parents came here in the 1960s, end of 60s, 70s, in order to escape the dictator, uh, which lasted about 30 years, the Duvalier regime. Uh, during that time, they were just one of thousands of Haitian immigrants who arrived on American shores, uh, seeking a more peaceful life. Um, and hence, thank you again for the Institute. Um, as you can see, the lack of peace has displaced so, so many for too long uh, around the world. Uh, so they arrived here with everyone coming with the same needs, the same goals, the same stories. And the story was pretty much the same. We'll be here for a few years until home becomes better. So home has been a central part of every conversation for my mother generation and my generation. Uh, they wanted to go back home. Uh, and they were, everything that they did centered around when they returned home. So that first generation, they were physically here, <laughs> but their soul really was still at home. Um, the children of that generation grew up in the United States, but in Haitian household, meaning the norms, the values, the family values, the norms, uh, the, what they call family education, uh, not formal education, family education was pretty much just like you'll find in a Haitian household back home. Uh, so we lived in New York, <laughs> but really in Haiti in some ways. So church was in Haitian Creole. I went to a bilingual school, which was French and English. Um, many Haitian teachers. So we were the, one of the oldest um, communities after the Cubans. Um, so we've been here for a long time. And prior to that, I think uh, also Haitian took pride that their history in the country went way back. So you had uh, Haitians who came right after the Haitian independence or during the revolution, uh, early 1800s, uh, mostly settling in Louisiana. Um, and going further than that, you had Jean-Baptiste Point de Sable, who was the founder of Chicago. Um, so in coming here, in some ways, uh, Haitian knew that the American history uh, and Haitian history was always intertwined. So we find ways to make the U.S. home in many facets, in every facet of our lives. Do you think the interest of um, having an impact in ID has diminished? Um, Definitely. Um, again, in the 70s and 60s, there are multiple waves of immigrants. Again, the, the ones that came um, in the 60s, 70s. We had another wave um, that came um, right after um, hurricane. We had multiple hurricanes. We had the, the waves that came in the 80s, actually, I forgot that. 80s, 90s um, were called boat people. Uh, that was a large wave um, escaping both political upheavals and um, economic uh, hardships. So that was a big wave of immigrants also coming from, with different skill set. So the, the generation of the 70s were pushed out, exiled. They were mostly educated um, that were pushed out by the Duvalier regime out of fear of being uh, having a coup 
So he exiled mostly professors, mostly professionals. Uh, so that generation quickly found spaces in uh, the American t tapestry uh, for work and so forth. Um, the generation of the 80s who came the wave, uh, it was more difficult for them. They came with less skill set uh, after living years in a country that had suffered um, a lot of civil unrest, where uh, many children suffered what we call interrupted education, uh, where school was open <laughs> some days, closed in other, um, many days because it was unsafe for kids to attend school. Uh, so that generation had more challenges. And um, the 60s against 70s, historically, it was after Vietnam and the US had an economic boom. So it was better times. Uh, later on, new immigrants were uh, often, um, I guess, demonized as taking American jobs, taking from resources that are already lacking. Uh, so that, again, caused uh, more um, challenges. So then we have multi-generations. So um, at the beginning, it was one generation mostly. Uh, mostly all of us work, were born in Haiti. So now we have, you know, from the 60s to now, <laughs> we have multi-generations. So that's one issue. Um, you have different goals and different needs. For someone, um, let's say, who was born in the United States, never been to Haiti, their needs and their wants are totally different from the generation that was preparing to uh, go back home. You, we are more spread out. Uh, the Haitian population is the fourth largest Caribbean population in the US after uh, Cuba, Jamaica, and the DR. Uh, so, pretty sizable in terms of sizable in terms of Caribbean population. Uh, we able to contribute in form of remittances uh, back home, uh, $3.3 billion. Um, that's about 37% of our gross uh, national product. Um, so those contributions are helping every day uh, f uh, from the Haitian population back home. And there's always, um, I guess, it's a transnational living. You know, people travel back and forth uh, less now because of what's happening mm. and contribute in many ways. Mm. Um, I'm jumping a bit to you, Hernando. Um, and we know that um, articulating diasporas that usually are heterogeneous, complex, is, is, is hard, and, and finding uh, common goals, common uh, ways to participate or common ideas is hard. But you, you have been also, uh, you, you came to the US as a, as a political asylum seeker, but last year you were a candidate for the Colombian House of Representatives, uh, representing the international constituency. Uh, I, I'm interested in, 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 in the politics. In, it's harder, you also work here in, in the city of Washington, uh, in the mayor's office, um, in the European of Latino community. Uh, it's, it's harder to put together and work, create a political conversation in the diaspora or is harder to be part of the political discussion in the country of origin um, as you try it and many of you Colombian uh, um, citizens are trying uh, from abroad. Um, hello everybody, thank you for, for your question and I just want to say thank you U.S. IP for inviting me to this event, Miriam K. And I want to start in, you know, say hello to my 
Latino diaspora or Hispanic diaspora. I want to say hello to Cristina Spinel from Colombian Human Rights Committee. Eh, Gustavo Amaya eh, from CECA de, de El Salvador and are part of the Red Lab, Latin American and the Caribbean Network for Democracy. Um, Andres Jara from, from Ecuador. Um, and I mean, this is uh, um, very good to see you here and all the ones talking about the diaspora. Um, I just wanna say something about myself. Uh, I'm coming from Colombia, from the Pacific Coast. I was born in Cali. Uh, an Afro-Colombian black or African descendant, uh, also Colombian, and here I'm Latino, Hispanic, Afro-Latino. I mean, <laughs> in the term of the diaspora is, as my colleagues say, say, dynamic, but it's vers versatile too, you know? Um, I had an history um, from Africa, you know, coming from the slave. And like a free in America, like a Bob Marley say, you know, uh, coming from Africa. But, um, an America too, like a last one you say, an America too. And, we are a Western Hemisphere, we are the continent, but we're coming from the south to the north. And not just the transatlantic you know, issue, is the, the, the regional issue for us. Uh, I'm coming you know, from New York from the second season of the Permanent Forum of African Descendants. It's over 2,000 people in the United Nations New York. This we call the African diaspora. Now trying to put in public issue the discrimination, the, the racism, the systemic racism. And it is the, the fight every day for us, you know, like uh, African descendant, black or African American. Um, in terms of the question, forgive me if I say something incorrectly. Uh, we got accent, like uh, you say, <laughs> because we're coming from, from Latino countries and, and trying to get English like, uh, as a second language. Uh, and I had some experience, you know, in that from my colleague from Haiti, from Sandra Duval, you know, as a professor and help to the, no, not just the black community, just the, the Latino community too. And this is an important thing for us. The Colombian migration has some historical context that denote the mobility for diplomatic reasons. The last year we celebrate or commemorate the 200 year of the relationship between Colombia and United States. And it means a lot, you know. 200 years. Um, it's, I mean, a diplomatic reason, but is there it that the labor too, and the education issues as well, and the search for opportunities about the, when the Frank Sinatra and other people call the American dream? You now, everybody coming, you know, trying to found the American dream. It's mean, you know, for a lot of people, a dream, for other people, is a nightmare. We talk about the immigration of our diaspora and the border of the South. You now the people coming, you know, to Mexico is a nightmare, you know. And also, we don't have, you know, a politics real here, you know, to support that migration, that diaspora, you know, to be, uh, to be better. 
Uh, it's necessary to make the dimension of Colombian migration due to the context of the war and the internal armed conflict that lead to forced displacement and that many compatriots came to the United States seeking to save their life through the refugee or political asylum. You know, this is a, a, a crisis, you know, the war in Colombia, the armed conflict. And this thing time, the USIP helped a lot of time, you know, to uh, speak up the voice, the reality in Colombia. Now we had a, a new government trying to change, you know, that reality for the people. And, and for me, uh, the message of the, of the President Petro called the Colombia a potencia mundial de la vida, you know, Colombian uh, potential life of the world, that is very important, you know. That say life too. Um, the Colombian population or, or the diaspora is among more than six, six million around the world. It's over um, one and a half million here in the United States. Um, the last year, we had no more than 230,000 you know, people from Colombia, you know, abroad, return back to Colombia. And this is an, an issue. We had to think about it, you know. Um, the CERAC is the institute about the migration, say something about the 35% of the Colombian migration are young people between 18 years and 30 years age. Um, this is a question, you know, for all the youth jacks coming out from the beautiful country. <laughs> Um, every four of the six, or every four of the ten Colombia coming by the fly, you know, and then stay here, don't return. It's not just the migration about the coming through Mexico. You now it's another kind of migration, you know, certified by visa or whatever you you got. By in terms of the remittances. The last year, Colombia exceeded the $10 billion, you know, the people in remittance to Colombia. And that's a very important issue, you know. And, but when you ask to the people what they do with that money, you know, is for food, a rent, or education, or something like that. And how can you now turn off and develop the country with that money? That is the, the, another question for, um, for the diaspora, too. And I mean, and in turn on the, your last question is, is necessary to connect with Colombian politics? We had you know, a minimal representation in the Congress, just one seat for the Colombian abroad. You know, like I say, it's over six million people you have one seat. But it's, the other thing is, 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 is pretty good because we got guarantee of the, our civil rights, you know, out of the countries, you know, the voice of the Colombian uh, inside. But we, we, got, we got just one, one seat. Um, this is the challenge, you know, for us about the, 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 the Colombian diaspora. Thank you, thank you, Lon. Amparo, just one question, a general question for you on the Salvadorian case. Uh, you, you have studied the, the Salvadorian diaspora for years, and, and I want to make you two questions. One, is democracy info, important for them? I mean, is democracy in, the, in El Salvador something that they are concerned about? And two, after years of being marginalized from the political debate in, in, in El Salvador, suddenly the Salvadoran diaspora is in the center of the political stage because, of the, because President Nayib Bukele decided to push 
harder in order to finally create the opportunity for the diaspora to vote. Um, probably because he thinks that his popularity will convert into votes. But at the same time, that opens a debate in the, in, in the political relationship between those that are abroad and, and the Salvadorians in the territory. And kind of that idea, that abstract idea of the diaspora who sends money, sends remittances, suddenly they have they can have a seat. The, the, it's prob probably the opposition uh, candidate to the presidency will be a Virginia resident. Um, and, and the vote of the diaspora can be relevant in the local scene, in the domestic scene. Um, again, do, does the diaspora be, uh, worry about democracy in, in El Salvador? And how do you think that the change of role will affect or impact the diaspora here? Okay, in, in, in terms of democracy, I think we have to ask all of our country how, how much their population are thinking about, me, uh, about democracies or how they care about democracy. I think that the Salvadoran diaspora cares about democracy as much as the Salvadoran population cares about dem democracy. Nada, yeah. nothing. Uh, or 80% of Salvadoran people think that democracy is not better than other regimes like, I don't know, monarchy or vocalization of society. They don't care about that. But I think Ecuador don't care much about democracy. The, the majority of the people, not the people who are seated here today. Uh, Colombia is the same. Colombia is talking about the Milagro Bukele, no? the, the miracle of Bukele's uh, and the improvements uh, that Bukele does in, 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 in our countries. Uh, and a lot of people are, are, are thinking that. So I think the diaspora is not, di is not different in that way. It's, it's not in, in Mune, in, we don't have a vaccination to to be more democracy and and to to take distance from these kind of proposals. Uh, and about the, the 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 person in the diaspora about Luis Parada, I I think personally I think it's a, a recognition about the importance of the migrant people, and I think it's something really incredible to have this candidate uh, that is thinking to, to fight for his beliefs. I think uh, at last uh, our diaspora is, is historically uh, invisibilized, invisibilized in El Salvador. So I think in, uh, it's really important for us to have this migration candidate that finally we are recognizing as a country that we are not just the, the territory in El Salvador, we are the country that lives in a lot of countries, that have people here in Washington, in Los Angeles, in Brisbane, in Milan, and that is important to, to listen, to understand, and to to embrace the heritage that they have to give us. That is. Rosalia, you wanted to add oh, something. Yes, um, thank you. Um, now I wanted to, um, and thank you for giving me a, a time. I, I won't be very long at all. It's something really, I think, important, especially being here at the Institute for Peace, uh, I should say the United States Institute for Peace, is that for the first time ever in Nicaragua, we're fighting without arms. It's a peaceful revolution. There are no arms. And I think that should be noted because, it, as I said, it's historical. Uh, and it, it, um, it fits this moment to share that with you. And uh, one other brief point is that I want to be sure that I recognize our diaspora groups all over the world, um, specifically, you know, in Costa Rica uh, and uh, 
where a lot of concentration of Nicaraguans are there. Um, that's the, the, the closest place to Nicaragua, so they go there, of course, Honduras. Um, and here in the United States, we are, it's, it's so interesting, we have actively engagement, uh, active engagement in the north, south, east, and west of the United States, and even in, in the mid uh, middle part of the country. We, believe it or not, we communicate daily um, and, and support one another so that we can then be there for those people like the 222 people that came in the airplane and others who desperately need our help who we have been here already. So we are together in this. Do we disagree? Yes, many times. But we agree to disagree and we try to be civil and respectful in the, in the differences. Do we fight? Yes, we fight. It's not all uh, roses. But then again, we remember why we're, why we're doing this. Because we want to go back to Nicaragua because we want to, to, uh, to, we want to, to give Nicaragua the chance to, be, uh, to, to, um, to obtain the democracy that we need. And the, we are, and I will close with this, we are, the diaspora is the voice, the voice of the voice who cannot speak. Because in Nicaragua, you cannot even, even fly the, um, this flag, which I brought here to show you. This is our flag. This flag cannot be flown in Nicaragua because you will go to jail if you're caught flying it. And I'm not kidding. And I'll leave it at that, because, but uh, I did want to recognize the diaspora um, recognition, uh, have a recognition for them. I don't think it's, um, I'm going to mention their names, but um, I, th I thought I would, but I think it's best not to. Anyway, thank you for giving me the time. Hello, Carlos Fernando Chamorro, the Nicaraguan journalist said a few days ago in an interview that journalists from exile is the last of the freedoms. Uh, and, and I, I think this is extraordinary how in some of our contexts, um, exile um, or, or, or being abroad is, is, is a space from, from which build um, not only democracy, but conversation, and, and, and yeah. when, when it's, it's impossible. And it's a, you, you cannot do it at all. And, and I, I just forget that Ortega Murillo took away the nationality of all the 222 people. The moment, by the time the plane landed, which was not the agreement, they had already been um, taken their Nicaraguan citizen. And two days later, he did it to 94 opposition leaders. I am third on the list. So I can also not go to my country. But then I was in jail, so I cannot complain. Thank you. And jumping to you, I'm, I'm closing with you, Sandra. But first, Fernando, usually, probably because of the Cuban case or the Cuban model in Florida, um, some people think that the capacity of, uh, of influence in the US policies uh, depends, in the case of diasporas, on the capacity not only of articulating a, a discourse, but the capacity of building themselves as a constituency. I mean, if you vote here, you can have influence. If you're not, you're not articulate, you can. Do you agree with that? <coughs> I mean, the Cuban case is, you know, it's, it's different. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sorry. Uh, I mean, the Colombian case is very different from the Cuban case, you know, but has a very, very similar mechanism mm -hmm. as, as in other countries, you know. Um, but we have to rethink about the, the advocacy, you know, and the influence we generate from United States to our countries sometimes can be good, sometimes can not. And not just in terms of Cuba, but the, the other countries like Venezuela, you know, Nicaragua, and Colombia too, you know, or, or Ecuador. And we had a lot of experience about the the another countries on mm, on dark teams, but I want to say uh, as a as a Colombian, we create a, a a very strong network. You know, I have to say 
all the times I can, the, the, the human rights committee, you know, by like Christina and other ones, Wola, you know, this is a, a network, you know, to support uh, the Colombian issues. But in fact, it's the first time in the Colombian history we got the first uh, Afro-Colombian uh, U.S. ambassador, you know. It's coming, you know, from the idea of the diversity and the inclusion of the President Petro, you know, to develop that kind of things and recognize. And also we had the, in, in a different ways, in 2010, in Colombia, we had the first uh, Afro-Colombian minister from culture. And it was a, a, a negotiation, you know, the president at that day trying to negotiate the, the, the TLC, the TLC, the trade agreement, you know, between Colombia and the United States. But the Congressional Black Caucus, they, I mean, you don't have anybody in, in the first position as a black. In Colombia, had over 10 million of black population in you. What are you thinking about the democracy and diversity? And um, I was the, the, the Congressional Black Caucus, you know, push in front of the, the president, the reality. And I mean, what's work for us? And the issue of the peace and human rights due to the incident of the organizations and Tin Tans help to create a new narrative, you know, a new history, you know, a new about the Colombian process. And it's necessary, you know, for for people from a country. And the we got the agreement 2016, the peace agreement you know, support by the President Obama. The President Obama doesn't support the peace agreement in Colombia. Yeah. That's not what's an, an issue. But he said, all the people, you know, here in Washington, D.C., you know, do the, the job to be now what we have. Thank you. Sandra, last question, and then we go to, to the audience. The, the situation in Haiti is always challenging uh, in many ways in, the, in terms of humanitarian priorities, uh, especially after since, since the 2010 earthquake. Um, it overlaps with the extreme crisis of violence uh, that uh, is happening now, and, and obviously the, the need for democratic reconstruction. Uh, ho, 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 which, which are the priorities from, from your, your perspective and where should the idea and diaspora be focusing uh, uh, in order to have some impact in, in, a, in, so complex, in a so complex situation? Okay. So um, looking at Haiti, in order to understand the challenges of Haiti today, one must definitely look at history and historical impacts of um, decisions, policies, foreign policies, internal policies that have led Haiti to what is she is today. Um, Haiti, again, for me as an educator, I feel that there is a desperate need to um, have counter narratives about Haiti, a desperate need to share accurate narratives about Haiti. So when we speak about Haiti, often the next sentence is Haiti, comma, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So when conversations start as such, um, for me, it seems that what follows is a lack of hope <laughs> because it's been happening for so long. And often I find myself trying to remind many that this is not the history of Haiti. It is part of the history um, staring us in
in the face every day that we have to contend with, but it's not the sole history of Haiti. Haiti started as a nation, as the sole, the only country, uh, black nation, to gain independence um, after a revolution. But that was not enough. Haiti has gone on after that to support Simon Bolivar and some with my sisters and brothers uh, from Latin America and uh, South America, uh, what was known as Grand Colombia. Uh, the flag of Venezuela was um, created in Jacques Mel, Haiti. Um, Haiti has fought in the American Revolutionary War here in Savannah. And um, you can, when you go to Savannah, please do stop and see the monuments erected uh, to salute those who fought. Haiti has been integral uh, and in many countries from Israel to Greece, you know, um, around the world as a beacon of hope, not just for Haitians, but for us as a human race. And it's ironic today that everywhere she knocks, <laughs> we are not wanted. Uh, ironic that Haiti, um, part of the Constitution of 1805 was to welcome um, people who were enslaved all over the world. Uh, De Salin at the time, um, who was our uh, leader at the time, invited the United States to send those who were enslaved and promised to pay for each enslaved person. It was a small amount, $40, $40 not enough. But, um, but the quest of Haiti has always been freedom. And to find her, to see her in this state where often I feel that she's invisible, unheard, is very painful for most Haitians. Um, so that is the narrative, I think, foremost, that is really important, where, what the diaspora must do to um, share the different narrative of Haiti. I think that's the first step, right? Uh, to understand the Haitian diaspora. Um, unlike many diasporas, we don't really have political voice or representatives. Mm -hmm. Um, in Haiti, um, but again, because of the support we, not just the money, which is a lot, uh, 3.3 billion, um, but the resources that the diaspora brings to Haiti. Uh, for example, I'm part of the Haitian uh, Academy Creole, I stand, which is there to make sure that there's equity in language. Uh, the Haitian constitution for the first time had recognized both French and Haitian Creole as, as official languages of Haiti. Uh, so again, bringing equity in education. Edu um, so diaspora participating in making sure that they preserve the culture of ha Haiti in the United States, um, or wherever they are, is important. And the ultimate way that in priority for me is peace. And um, that's why I was so grateful uh, to be invited here and share my voice, which is only one voice, but um, many carry uh, those wishes, <laughs> which is to see peace in Haiti. Um, every day is a challenge for people going to school, uh, going to buy bread, um, their kidnappings, extortion for money from gangs. Um, there's no life. So democracy happens when people are educated. Uh, people have time to philosophize about what the ideal life is. But every day in Haiti is a challenge. So for me, having dialogue about what is happening, what has happened, uh, having dialogue that is inclusive, 
uh, because Haiti, we found that over the years, uh, there has been a classist system from the time of revolution. You had the mulattoes versus the maroons and the enslaved or newly freed. Later on, you have um, the Arabs, uh, mostly coming from Syria, um, an, another clash of cultures. Uh, then you had the American <coughs> occupation before that, I guess, 1915. Um, so there are so many unresolved discussion or dialogues um, that needs to be openly um, viewed, discussed, in order to bring peace to Haiti. Um, there's no cohesion <laughs> because there's a lack of understanding. There's no cohesion because there's a conflict between those who practice voodoo, which is the uh, religion of our ancestors from Africa, and the Christian religious groups has been clashing since 1860s, I want to say. Uh, those need to be resolved. We need to have those hard, difficult uh, conversations. Uh, so for me, I would love to see the continuation of those dialogue before we jump to action um, and let the Haitian community at home also participate and honest dialogue about their needs. And they are capable of solving the problems that they understand way better than us. Uh, we can share resources, we can share our own knowledge, but they, they are bringing with them intimate knowledge of the suffering and the challenges that we, we definitely need to account for that. So first, I guess safety. <laughs> Uh, nothing can happen. Innovation cannot happen if people cannot sleep at night. Innovation cannot happen if kids cannot go to universities. Um, so that's the first. Thank you. We have time for, <laughs> well, a oh, lot of hands. Uh, let's go and, um, get some questions and then we made a final round of answers, please. Um, let's start on the top. and. I, I, I will please Spa for the Espanol or English? <laughs> well, English, <laughs> English? Or okay. Well, there is one thing that uh, I think we are getting confused: migration and diaspora. Diaspora is something that might cause migration. That's something, and the thing, the diaspora is just when the people is not feeling belong or doesn't feel pertinence in a place. And and the thing that I, I see that and the link is the, how democracy can help on that. How much people is identified or how can be identified with their own countries so they can be there, fight there and do something in there without becoming diasporas. We have the Venezuelan case, we have the, the Colombian, we have the Nicaraguan, which is so serious. So that is the thing, and I think that is the question for you guys, when how democracies can really solve the problem. The, is the Democratic Party a solution? It reinforced democracy might be a solution to do not cause uh, diasporas? Thank you. Thank you. Here and then here. Hi. Thank you. Um, I want to ask this question, and you answer part of my question, but it's very curious because I want to know the definition of diaspora, because the same, I was here in diaspora and immigration and I was very confused. And I'm asking this why, because we talk about, for example, the Nicar Nicaraguenses, when the political prisoners arrived here in Washington, some people from Nicaragua 
living in Washington reject them, and other people support them. In, in the case of Colombia, I'm a human rights defender, and I'm rejected for a lot of Colombians because I think the way that I think. And then that's very confused. Diaspora, but the diaspora, I don't know, it's a little confusing. Maybe I can help just not, not to make a mess and before we go further into this. Diaspora, by definition, is the spread of people out of his homeland. So it includes, we, we can go <laughs> in, into semantics, but includes any kind, any region that force or makes people to live abroad. That's why we talk about diaspora, including exile, exile people, migration, many kinds of migrations, and we, we, uh, including all the people, all the nationals abroad, that's a diaspora, right? So it's including different regions, different profiles, just to make that clear, to make it easier for us to... Yeah. So, yeah, I just want to, if you don't mind, yes, uh, because of... Do you okay? Give me a minute. Make, claro, okay. We, we get the, thank, the, the, thank you very much. I'll make it quick. First of, all, first of all, great conversation. Thank you for USIP for convening this, this great panel. Sandra, thank you for sharing the history of your country. I salute your heritage. My question goes to Amparo. I want to pick up on, on the moderators on Jose Luis's question about the upcoming elections. Any opposition candidate any opposition candidate against uh, the President unconstitutional re-election of, of President Bukele is going to engage in a quixotic fight. The odds will be stacked against him or her or them, whoever they might be. We are now eight months uh, away from the elections, basically, give or take okay. a few days. My understanding is that the con in, in this election is going to have a, a the diaspora vote by electronic means, which is going to make it a lot easier and more than likely is going to increase significantly the number of votes. My understanding is that the contract for the company, the software company that's going to manage it, has actually not been let yet. Uh, and this takes preparation. Uh, we saw what happened with the rollout of the Chivo wallet, the Bitcoin wallet, which was an absolute disaster. So, you know, one, one has reason, I think, to be concerned. And the uh, OAS has not yet been invited to monitor the, you know, the, the, the elections. And I think that at a minimum, those Quixotes that will you know, engage in the election against Bukele, they deserve to have you know, the, uh, the, the rules respected, whatever those rules are. So how concerned are you about the integrity of the elections? independent of you know, the, the odds stacked against whoever might be opposition, but the integrity of the elections. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we can make a final round standing there and with final comments on the questions of anything you want to add. Nando, please start. Thank you. Uh, in turn the question for Andres and, and Cristina, I mean, the response was, like you say, the, the diaspora, you know, is, is a dispersion of the people. Um, we got that, and as an African descendant, we had the example like uh, the African Union. The Africa have five regions. In 2001, they developed the sixth region, and they called the diaspora. It means the people wasn't enslaved, you know, and dispersed around the world, you know. That means for the African descendant diaspora. And, and I agree with Christina, you know, because when we're talking about the, the, the Colombian diaspora or Colombian population is a different ideology, you know, different perspective. We're coming from different regions from our home. You know, I'm from the Pacific Coast, you know, Christina from the center, you know, from the Bogota. We had from the Caribbean, and also we had the, 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 the island called San Andres in, in Providence, and they related by the, 
feel more comfortable now or, or, or more accurate with the Nicaraguans because it's the sea flower region, you know, and we lose the 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 fight and the international core about the the the, the San Andres because they are a right salt or Creole population now on, on the Caribbean Sea. Um, but the, the diaspora is mean to when the people, you know, coming, you know, not returning home. Like I say, my mom is not part of the diaspora because she lives in Colombia. She doesn't move from from the hometown. I'm part of the Colombian diaspora, um, but she is part of the African diaspora. <laughs> it means, you know. Um, but we have to discuss uh, and, and, and redefine, you know, the diaspora because, like I say, it's dynamic, versatile, you know, and and that he, and the new generation had a, a new thinking, you know, because the the new generation are more connected uh, around the world, you know, about with the technology and, and other issues. Thank you, Amparo. Uh, one thought about diaspora, uh, we, some years ago, we interviewed uh, 500 Salvadoran people in the airport of El Salvador, and we asked them where they want to be buried. And 50, uh, we, we talked with people who has lived in the United States for 40 years or for 30 years or in Calgary for 25 years. Uh, and 60% of all of these Salvadorans say they want to be buried in El Salvador. So I think uh, in terms of migration, in terms of diaspora, the bonds, the, the, the roots are, are, are really strong. We don't lose this identity, so it's just interesting. And about your question, about how concerned I am. Well, I, I am really concerned about what is going to happen. And I think uh, I am reading a book that I don't remember the title, but it's a book that is studying the democracy process or the systemic political process in Philippines, in Turkey, in Brazil, in Hungary and in Turkey, I don't know. It's five countries. And in this book, they have this question that said, can democracies die democratically? <laughs> and I think that's the question that we can answer in the process of El Salvador. I think we are testifying that democracies can die democratically. Because Bukele was a democratic president elected by, by a lot of the people. But he is now uh, fighting against, against all the democratic principles. And I think we are going to, to live a lot of, of anti-democratic process in the next years, not in the next eight months. I think in the next 10 years, we are, we, we are going to rethink about what the academic uh, people in El Salvador and the diasporas uh, talk about the, demo the democracy with a lot of Salvadoran people. Thank you. Sandra? Um, thinking about um, diaspora, um, for most Haitians traveling to Haiti, diaspora, that word almost feels like a curse, like you've been, <laughs> um, oh, you don't know anything. You just diaspora. Oh, you cannot contribute anything you don't understand because you're just a diaspora. <laughs> but we come to understand the meaning 
of diaspora of those who've been either displaced, uh, forced to escape, or choose to leave a space, a country, be, do, on their own volition. Or sometimes I call it, my house is on fire. I go to my neighbors. Is it really a choice? And that was for many Haitians um, being part of the diaspora <coughs> due to both push because the dictator, supposedly democratic dictator, <laughs> uh, elected Francois Duvalier for 30 years, um, pushed many out. And of course the pull because the ideal that the United States offered, you know, the pursuit of happiness, um, education, uh, opportunities uh, beyond dreams. And of, of, often I call uh, my parent generation the sacrifice generation because um, it's interesting you brought where do you want to be buried uh, for Haitians of that generation is don't let me die here. Uh -huh. uh, if I'm dying, bring me home. Yeah. If you have my so ashes, cool. bring them home. Uh -huh. um, that sense of connection in Haiti culturally also, uh, they always say where your umbilical cord is buried. So in all old African tradition, when a child is born, they will take the, the, the umbilical cord and bury it and put a seed and Plant a tree, it makes sense now that we understand science, maybe all that um, gives nourishment you know, to the tree. Um, so often people relate to where their umbilical cord is buried, the home, uh, not only the country, but the actual province or city where they're from. Um, and so diaspora means different things to different people. For some people, I, uh, they shun the word, meaning you, you don't totally belong here. And often me, I call myself the in-between generation because I, I, even though I went to Haiti back and forth my, all my life from the time I came here 10, 11 years old till graduate school, um, till currently, um, back and forth, I was never truly Haitian because I had African-American norms that became some of my repertoire when I went back to Haiti. And then when I was here, I wasn't totally African-American because I wasn't black enough. Um, and unfortunately, many hadn't widened their understanding of what blackness is, the full breadth of what it means to be black or to have roots in the African continent. So that narrow definition left many of us vacillating somewhere in between. At some point, thank God, identity is fluid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I came to embrace in between. It's a beautiful place <laughs> to live where I truly understand American norms, Haitian norms, and even norms that are masked in places that I visited, Japan, mm -hmm. Indonesia, that resemble mm -hmm. my norms, and, um, and not having to choose. Choosing to love both the United States that has given me so much, and Haiti, where my soul has flourished. You know, um, I think diaspora has to be a term that allows different people to see themselves whichever way they may see themselves. You know, either fully or hyphenated, meaning uh, something American, right? Um, and I think that allowance is also the start of peace, right? Allowing people to self-identify and allowing that identity to find ways to contribute to the native country from that lens, from that understanding, right? Um, all those voices are part of the diaspora. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We're, we're on time, but I think we can have. 
think two, three, three I, I minutes. will definitely be trying to be uh, brief. Um, but I was um, taken aback a little bit, uh, but I understand what you were saying about Nicaraguans or the diaspora and maybe not accepting everyone. I think that's a human nature. Um, that's something that maybe will never be resolved is the have nots, the haves and have nots perhaps. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that um, that, that is not resolved yet, um, but I do know that the Nicaraguans that, are, that came and that continue to come are embraced by the majority of Nicaraguans. Um, that's one thing, and, um, and I'm going to time myself here with that minutes. Um, I wanted to also, even though uh, we had a very good explanation of what the di diaspora term means, um, you know, I just wanted to give a, a, and I'm not going to repeat, but it's just a, an interesting little fact that the first known diaspora was the result of the Babylonian exile. And I had this prepared before I came. I didn't just get it here. Um, there was the Babylonian exile of the Jews in 586 BCE, which uh, to my knowledge, I used to use BC before, but it's actually meaning before the common era and it's, both terms are interchangeable. Um, so after the Babylonians conquered the kingdom of Judah, part of the Jewish population was deported into slavery and became the first known diaspora. Um, I wanted to uh, repeat what I said before that um, e exile is the consequence of political persecution in Nicaragua, I'm referring to, and threats to one's liberty. And in Nicaragua, that's why they're here. Uh, especially those 222 people. Um, and in closing, I think it's fair for me, for you to know how, how interestingly it is that we, Nicaraguans, the young diaspora that began only uh, to form itself in 2000, 2018, we are so caring and, 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 and trying to come together to help others. And among those are NFSA, FUNADEX, NFSA here in Washington, Nicaragua Freedom Coalition, FUNADEX in Texas, Asamblea Nicaragua Libre Los Angeles, and Nicaraguenses in El Exilio in Ohio, La Mesa in New York, New Jersey, I just have two more to go, IPC in Florida, NARA, which, which is a, the, the legal arm of, of the diaspora here, uh, and in Costa Rica, eso es Nicaragua, hagamos democracia. Uh, in Europe, I mean, I could go on and on. The European diaspora is also you know, working together to welcome those uh, Nicaraguans. So we are doing our best. Uh, we have some good examples. The, the, the Cubans are organized themselves very well. They've been at it for 60 plus years. Uh, uh, and so we, we keep trying to do our best. Uh, I am so grateful to be here because as far as I know, and I am Nicaraguan in the United States for 60 plus years, um, but when 2018 came, 2018, I jumped off my seat and I said, I cannot sit back. I must do something about this. And there I am, but I'm only one example of so many of us. Lastly, it's the first time that I remember that an, a, an organization, uh, an entity like the, Institute for, the United States Institute for Peace has given this opportunity for the, the theme, the, the, the topic of the di diaspora. So thank you for that, and we applaud you. Thank you so much. Steve. Thank you. Uh, yes, before going to kiss to say bye or closing, I, I just want to close with an anecdote I, I think is, is, in, is interesting. Uh, in San Salvador, when you enter the city coming from the airport, there's this really ugly monument <laughs> that used to be called for a while, for, for some time, Monumento al Hermano Lejano. Uh, um, um, diaspora communities ask explicitly to change that name, that name because they say it properly, obviously, that they are not far away, that they are close, that they are present. And the name changed into Hermano bienvenido a casa. And now, even if it, it is for political reasons, um, as part of a, a strategy, a political strategy, when you arrive in the uh, San Salvador airport, Monsignor Romero airport, you find big, big um, letters, hashtag diaspora SB. It can be a brand, it can, it can, it can be a lemma, 
part of a political uh, effort, but it's a change. And I think it's, it's an expression that something is changing for many reasons, but it's a change that has no going back. Um, I hope the change will be for better in the case of El Salvador, and I think the diasporas will be in big letters in all of our countries for the right reasons, probably, <laughs> hopefully, uh, in the future. So thank you, thank you. To, to all of you. Yes. Thank you, Jose Luis. Well, yeah, I want to thank all of our panelists, and especially Jose Luis, for the, the excellent moderation that you've done. We're a few minutes over time. There is a reception upstairs. I want to invite everyone to join us for some snacks upstairs. In his seminal book, uh, The Study of History by Arnold Toynbee, one of the best books about kind of the flow of civilization across the world, one of the, he has a big, big section on the cruce de culturas and how cultures influence each other by parts of their population moving, coming back. There's, there's always this, this flow of our cultures. We in the United States, of course, are a country of many diasporas, and we uh, were most appreciative of that. The question here, and I hope we've opened this conversation, is how can those diasporas now help to strengthen democracy and development in their home countries? And it is a huge challenge. And I appreciate all the comments that have been, uh, been offered today on that. And I hope we can now begin this conversation and look for ways to strengthen it so that these, these uh, powerful constituencies and, and, uh, and, and um, intelligent and, and hardworking individuals in the United States, but from countries that are still really struggling, can have a, a positive impact on their home country. So I hope we've started that conversation and look forward to continuing it. Thank you very much. <laughs>